everybody, and welcome to Inside D2 Football. Along with Justin Polizzi, Tony Nicolette, Matt Witwicky, Chuck Bittner, Chris Ferguson, and special guest tonight, Antonio Clark. I am Brandon Meisner. It's a pleasure to have you with us. So what's going on tonight? Uh, we'll talk about the top 25 battle between Western Colorado and Colorado Mines. The GSC had a top 25 battle of its own. Valdosta State was at West Florida. Overall, four teams lost to unranked opponents. We'll talk about that and more in our top 25 review. And we'll do a deep dive into tomorrow's regional rankings. What could they look like? Well, you'll stick with us. You'll find out. Uh, we'll also do our pick segment, answer questions and criticisms in the overtime period. And uh, all that and more. So we're getting close to crunch time at the end of the regular season. What a great time of year. So. Thanks again for watching Inside D2 Football. Tonight, we start with a battle of undefeated teams as Western Colorado traveled to Golden to try to establish our max supremacy, but the Ore Diggers reign supreme with a 42-7 win. A, a good win by the Ore Diggers, Matt. Yeah, a game I thought we were all kind of waiting to see. And, you know, I'll tell you right now, it was kind of the main game I was really most intrigued about. 5,500 sellout crowd and uh, you see kind of right away, uh, Mines gets after it, Max McLeod with the, with the score from Matoka. Then, uh, you know, get, they're getting after the quarterback right away. And uh, Mines was really controlling the first half, despite the fact that the score was not really changing a whole lot. Here's Matoka getting loose. Uh, this guy's got the guts of a burglar. I mean, just look at him. <laughs> and then he, gets, he gets pushed out of bounds, just gets right back, luck, luck like nothing. Then we, you know, we've got Roper here for the score. And... Mines is up 14 nothing, and it's they're in control kind of the whole way. And then, you know, you get, get a touchdown pass right here, you know, for, from Western, and they're right back in the game. Then we get to the second half, and the snow is coming down, and Mines is running the football real good and not allowing much in the run, as you can see here as they kind of gang up a little bit. Uh, Matoko rolls right, finds his man, and this game is starting to change a little bit. We got a 21, you know, uh, point deficit. They picked off, uh, you know, two passes, five sacks. I mean, they're they're they were really getting after uh, Western up front. And then you see here he finds his man in the back. Matoka does, and yeah, this is just kind of how things were going as the game continued. It it kind of felt like Western lost a little bit of their spirit once the score really started to turn. Fumble here, and uh, then mine scores again. To kind of close out the action in a 42 to 7 contest and you know if we're gonna be real honest uh, it was a little bit of a letdown i thought brandon for us because we were expecting really a knockdown drag out game and uh i got a feeling my guy antonio was thinking the same thing yeah um i i i understood that mine's front seven and i i knew i knew how serious they were but i also thought westerns was and I think Mines kind of kind of put that notion to bed uh, throughout the game. It Matoka he did his thing as he always does, but uh, how how they pushed around Western as the game went on, as the snow came down, it, it was really crazy to see up close in person. Antonio, was, let me ask you as as our guy who covers the RMAC, um, you got a chance to obviously be at a, be at a whole lot of big RMAC games. Uh, how would you rate this one in terms of the environment with it and everything else and did it kind of have a, a big game feel? Oh, it was a huge game. Like, um, it, it drew me back to some of my playing days. Like, we played Mines in 2016 when they had Justin Dvorak, who won the Harlan Hill that year, and we ended up beating them. Um, we were ranked in the teens. They were in the top ten. It was it was insane, but it was bigger now because they've done renovations. The stadium is huge. The energy – the Western fans showed up. The Western sideline – was packed out like the tailgate before was awesome. It, it was a great environment, and the attention that the RMAC got this week, I think, it bodes well for the conference as they try to become more and more competitive at the national level. Yep, good, very good. Well, tell you what, let's go ahead and get it from uh, the point of view from the man on the sidelines, Pete Sturbeck, the head coach at Colorado School of Mines, joins us. Pete, thank you very much for being here tonight. You bet. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Coach, uh, first off, congrats on your big win. Uh, as we just mentioned, we kind of weren't expecting it to go exactly like that. Um, heck, even a few of us dopes here on the set might have even picked Western. I don't know who I could be speaking of. 
But, uh, you know, the game got going. You know, all of a sudden it got pretty one-sided after we thought it was going to be really a tight match. And, you know, what were some of the things that really gave you the impression that things were going well for your squad uh, in that first half? Well, we were able to come out that that first series and we had a 16 play drive um, that we ended up not scoring on. But the fact that we were just able to kind of do what we had planned on doing, which isn't always the case. Um, right. And then, you know, we turned it over and our defense kind of made him go backwards, um, you know, and then we got to a fourth down in the red zone the next drive. And, um, you know, defense did the same thing, got it back to us. and We were able to score after that. But our defense coming out and just being relentless to the ball. I mean, that's just. It's kind of our, kind of our our mo and our staple and our identity is populating the football. And um, Trip Thomas, our D coordinator, does a great job, and he had those guys really ready. And you know, it's it's interesting with with the coverage, like Antonio, like you were talking about, sh- it, showing a pretty good light on the RMAC. Um, but our guys hearing about Western and hearing that people were thinking they were on our level, um, I think our kids kind of took offense to that, and um, it probably just added to the you know the fuel of the fire and. As much fire as we already have intrinsically, it only helped us. And, um, you know, so early on, once I saw our defense playing like that, I knew we were going to start scoring some points and a little later than I would have liked. But, you know, we got rolling pretty good. And and uh, it was really fun to just see things go according to what our plan was. Coach, how important was it establishing and just winning the line of scrimmage on both sides of the ball in this one? It was big time. You know, anytime you can get on a quarterback's toes early, um, and put some some uh, contact to him. It's going to make him question himself. Um, you know, they have some good receivers. They have some guys with some speed. Um, but you know, to to take advantage of that speed, you got to give your quarterback time, and so those receivers can get separation. And they just didn't have much chance of that. Um, you know, and then our ability to spit the ball on the perimeter, make them run sideways, and um, pick up first downs that way, but also hand it off and change up our personnel as we went along and our line's pretty good. Um, and we were able to lean on them off and on throughout the game and pick and choose when we wanted to throw. And so that was, that was absolutely huge for us. Coach, you might've noticed, but people tend to focus a little bit when it comes to minds on your offense, that Harlan yeah. Hill winner you got, um, you know, I couldn't help but notice yesterday how much juice your defense was playing with. You know, you guys play with a lot of energy. And I know you're an offensive guy, but, you know, you probably couldn't help but notice how your group was harassing Drew Nash and, you know, making him really uncomfortable. You know, five sacks probably speaks to that. But what were your observations uh, on the defensive effort yesterday? Yeah, I mean, that's just an identity thing for us. Our guys fly around. They love to play ball. Um, Trip has them ready every week. And, you know, we feed off of it. You know, being an offensive guy and and calling plays, um, we like to be able to keep ourselves, you know, both sides of the ball, really. When the defense is playing well, then we can keep doing offensively what we have planned. And then when we're playing well, when we're scoring, when we're in drives with touchdowns, it allows Trip to, to keep pulling the trigger on those blitzes and mixing things up and keep people on their heels. Um, and we, like everybody calls it team football, but when we can really feed off of each other, it's just, it's a blast. I love seeing those guys fly around on defense and keep getting the ball back to number 10. Yeah. You know, your, your team hasn't played a ranked opponent in over a month. And you kind of touched on this a little bit earlier that yeah. you guys are kind of juiced for the game because of perceived, whether real or is not real disrespect. Mm-hmm. Um, did that light? How did that light a, a fire under under your rear ends? And and it, it, is it is it real disrespect, or is it just like a case where Jordan would always find something to get him motivated? It's Which funny is- you bring that, yeah. It's funny you bring that up um, because I've I read that book Relentless, and um, we talk about we we actually had our seniors read that book, and he would I kind of identified with that, you know, always looking for extra motivation. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know how real it is. I don't, I don't know that we truly felt disrespected, but we wanted to just prove what we thought was the difference between us and them. Um, you know, obviously we started out playing Grand Valley and Angelo and, and we get into conference play. And I, I think there's definitely some good challenges in our conference, but yeah, we hadn't played a ranked opponent in a while. And, you know, we were excited to go do that here at home and love the idea with them coming in with, you know, in one of the polls being top 10 and, and Jazz has a great program. I think they are a really good team. Um, we just liked our chances going in. We felt like there was some matchups for us that we could take advantage of, and fortunately it came to fruition. 
you know, it's kind of wild that if we look back, Coach, to even pre-COVID, 2019, okay, you're you're the OC there. You know, you're just starting off with mines. You got a what a, a true freshman, John Matoka. Mm-hmm. Hey, man, this is before COVID. Hmm. He ends up being your starter. You guys go 12 and one. You win a playoff game over some Sioux Falls team that I'm familiar with. And I mean, it's crazy to think we're now talking about 2023, and he's still your quarterback. Um, what is your relationship with John? And, you know, is he kind of like having another coordinator on the field at this point? Yeah, he's definitely come a long ways in that regard. Um, you know, in 19, the first game we played was against Adams State. We just didn't have the production that we wanted um, offensively. We got the win, and we decided to go with John over a couple older guys. Um, and so early on, I mean, you, it, he hadn't taken a lot of reps in fall camp, but he had shown enough where he knew there was something special there. Plus, the, just the type of person he is. If you meet him, you right. can just get that sense. He's just he has that moxie and that presence. Um, but the game plans were, I mean, not not unbelievably simple. I was I was up in the box. It's not like I came down on the field so I could communicate with him. Um, I trusted him. But as we've gone along, things have gotten more expanded in the game plan. Um, you know, and he he made some checks the other day that were real veteran type checks, just little things, and they were in the run game, um, which was just awesome. And we you know, the two or three times he did it, we got first downs on short yardage. And um, so, yeah, it was it was really cool. And, you know, when you get to that point with the quarterback, but he's going to have uh, you know, a certain amount of recall, things to revert back to, things you've experienced sure. together. I think his anticipation of what I'm going to call probably more than anything, you know, he tells me, oh, I knew you were going to call that on that, you know, when we're on the 12-yard line on third down or what, whatever it is. Um, and it's hard to fake that. You got to build it. Um, so it is definitely pretty special at this point. And, we have a great relationship. I mean, it's we, we're both competitive and fiery and, you know, me coming down to the field and calling it, obviously, as the head coach has been, you know, a little bit of an adjustment. But honestly, I think it's made our communication better. Um, maybe he doesn't feel that way sometimes if he throws a pick or something. He's got to – I'm right there instead of having to ignore getting on the headphones for a couple of minutes. But, so it's been great. He's, he's a, a real special player. Uh, you kind of almost answered my question for you there, Coach. But what, what have been some of the challenges – of going from the booth being just an offensive coordinator to being a head coach and all that that encompasses, not only just, you know, on the field, but all the off the field stuff. Like what has that transition been like for you? You know, I, I had done it before I was at McPherson college in 2012 and 13 um, with less resources. So, I mean, I, I was coaching two positions and calling it and doing all that kind of stuff. And our staff has been, I mean, Tim Brandon has the offense coordinator title, and he has a heavy, heavy influence on the game plan, coaching our line. He's right with me on the sideline, and um, I really lean on him a bunch. And then Ryan Diedrich's up in the booth. He's our receivers coach, and he's great with the pass game. So, you know, I might be the one making the calls, but those guys, they, they carry me a lot of the times and making suggestions, even if it's on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, as we're, as we're getting into the week. Um, so that's been huge. But it's been different. You know, you deal with – with meetings and different things that, you know, you just weren't dealing with before. And that's just, that's how it goes. But for sure, having done it before for a couple of years um, has definitely prepped me. And then, you know, when you have a veteran team, there's probably a lot of things I'm not great at within being a head coach yet that hopefully I can get to that point, but we have so many veterans around us and they're probably masking some of that. So hopefully they can keep carrying me along. You know, I've, I've got one final question for you kind of piggies back on everything we've talked about and on AC's question that he just had. But I want to tell you a story about a friend of mine, Coach Mel Churchman from Northwest Missouri. He's in the College Football Hall of Fame. One year his team had to play early. They had to play like Arkansas Tech, and I could be getting this wrong, but I remember his his statement. Then like Pitt State and Nebraska Omaha were like the first three games. And he, you know, he survived that and he talked about now we can breathe and we can get along to the business of developing the team. And I kind of laughed that, you know, he felt he had to survive an early punch and then he could develop the team. Do you, and again, feel free to tell me if I'm wrong, but does do you, do you do, does that resonate with you this year because of the early schedule and then some great games at the back end? Yeah, it was interesting when I got the job, was, which was obviously a lot later than a lot of people get a head coaching job, is at the end of April um, and May 3rd officially. And one of the first things I told our guys that, that and I wasn't going to depart from what coach Moore had planned for us you know I was a part of this and 
but I wanted to make sure we started from the start, you know, and we talk about national championship last year all the time. And, and, and that was great, but we started 0 two and we had to climb back every week and, and backs against the wall. And, and that was great that we did that, but we didn't, you know, I was like, told the guys, I don't want to be 0 two, you know, let's, so let's really lock in early. Um, so that was a huge focus for our guys. I mean, we didn't overemphasize it, but at the same time, you know, that was something that we wanted to get off on the right foot. Um, so yeah, once you get past, we got past those first two games, it, there probably was a, a brief sense of, God dang, we, we did what we planned and, and what we talked about doing. And our guys just were, did a great job executing both those game plans and coming through. And, you know, then you get in a conference and, you know, your next goal is just week by week staying in it. And I always say each week's kind of like its own case study. That's how we treat it. You know, we don't change anything, you know, like extensively, but, you know, you cater it to who you're playing and, and just try not to get ahead of yourself. And you get to this point, you got a couple games left and we got we got to handle our business. But it's uh, it's pretty awesome to be to this point and just with a great group of kids. And we've got uh, a lot bigger goals ahead and we just got to keep rolling. Very good. Well, Pete, we really thank you for joining us tonight. Wish you the best of luck the rest of the way out. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks so much for what you guys do for D2. Really appreciate you guys. Thanks a lot. Thank Thanks, you very buddy. much. That was Pete Sturbeck, the head coach at Colorado School of Mines. Uh, let's go ahead and talk about Boss's Pizza and Chicken. Wit. Um, we obviously failed our eating contest, but uh, <laughs> uh, I don't think we need to keep bringing that up, even though it's I just like, like that. You up the fat guys right there. I like the way you did. What's that? What did you say? Yeah. We had a story? You, you up the fat guys. <laughs> let's go. <laughs> <laughs> in, in any case, uh, 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 there was something that resonated with me. Uh, in their advertising as I was looking at their website and uh, they had mentioned something and a quote from the website says an independent pizza delivery restaurant that goes to battle against all the change. We often aren't able to do all the marketing that the big boys can do uh, to get new customers to try our product. And that very much resonated with me and what we've done on D2 football for 20, uh, 24 years now. And uh, I just uh, would hope that Anybody who lives in an area where there is a boss's pizza and chicken would uh, try them out. And of course, last week we talked about uh, their first and tenders, which is uh, a different uh, a different menu item than than people are used to. And Wit had them on the show, uh, ha- ate them on his show, and felt that they were good. So uh, we invite you to check those out as well. Uh, also, if you look uh, at the upper right hand corner of the image that's on the screen right now you can see the link to franchise so if you are a business person if you are interested in uh, uh, partnering with bosses uh, pizza and chicken click on that link tell them you heard about it from us i think it's a wonderful business opportunity there are lots of towns in my neck of the woods in the miaa where i think it would be perfect uh, in fact, uh, one of them might be where my alma mater is located. I think that would be uh, just a, a home run in that town as a sports bar with the with the pizza and chicken. But uh, if you are interested in that, please click on the franchisee or the franchise link and uh, join the bosses uh, chicken and pizza team. Well, let's go ahead, gentlemen, and let's talk about the top 25. Uh, the results from that. Let me get the right orientation and we'll bring up. Uh, the score is from the top 25. And let's start with uh, West Florida, a uh, hosting Valdosta State. And Valdosta was able to come away with a 31-28 win, an exciting win for uh, the Blazers, Chuck. Yeah, well, a couple of us took a flyer on uh, on taking Valdosta for the win in this one, and uh, mm-hmm. I was I was one of them. The funny thing is, I, I actually thought that was a bigger reach than than picking Western Colorado, uh, so I was proven <laughs> wrong on both fronts. But um, no, this was a very interesting game because you know I spend a lot of time digging through stat sheets and box scores after I watch a game because of all the stuff that we do, and this is definitely one of those games where if you showed me the stat sheet afterward. I would have said, well, you know, better luck next year, Valdosta, because there's no way that that's a winning stat sheet. Um, but they were opportunistic. They made some stops when they really needed to. Um, and they were very resilient in this game. You know, Valdosta was down 14 to nothing. And when they fell behind, I thought, boy, this this just kind of feels like where things have gone wrong for them uh, over the last year or so, just kind of falling behind and playing from behind and just not being able to catch up. Well, the defense really kind of caught fire, made a couple stops. They got a defensive score in this game, which was big. 
And then they really were able to start working their passing game. The interesting thing that I thought was you know a huge factor in this game, and I actually thought it would be, Pee Wee Jarrett rushing the ball was a huge X factor. And that's not normally a, a big part of West Florida's game plan. Uh, but they really needed him because we know that if you're going to beat Valdosta, you attack straight at them. You run the ball downhill at them. That's their weakness. Uh, and they really used Pee Wee Jarrett to do that. But in the end, it wasn't quite enough. The Blazers did hold up to their passing game really well. Uh, and you got to give a lot of credit to Valdosta State. They made plays when they really had to, including the, the touchdown pass we saw at the start of that highlight reel. So this is a really, really big win for, Val for Valdosta. I think it takes some pressure off the coaches, takes a little bit of pressure off the team probably restores a little bit of confidence and in, in everybody there, including the fan base. So, you know, there's still work to be done. There's still tough games ahead, but this is a really, really big win that Valdosta had to have. Right. Uh, another team or a team that fell from the ranks of the unbeaten was Lenore Ryan. The bears fell at Wingate uh, 34 to 30, a real, real fun ending to that one, Justin. Yeah, it was. Uh, you know, this game was a, a phenomenal football game. When you looked at it in the pregame, it was two of the best defenses, not just in the sack, but two top 10 defenses in the country. And, and that's kind of what you were thinking it was going to be was a defensive showdown. Uh, and, and that really wasn't the case. You know, Wingate got the scoring started early. Um, and and every time Wingate scored or Lenore Ryan scored, the other team had the answer. It was score for score pretty much the whole game. It was phenomenal, and and it's not really what you were thinking it was going to be, again, with those top 10 defenses, but it really came down to, to the fourth quarter and the last couple possessions, right? So uh, Wingate, or Lenore Ryan, rather, uh, they take the lead with 101 to play, okay? They score, they, they go up, and it's 30 to 27. Wingate gets the football back, and it's a 75 yard touchdown pass to take the lead with 50 seconds left. So it's back and forth. Lenore Ryan has the football. They're down to the Wingate 20, uh, in, in Wingate, um, about 25 yard line with about four seconds left, and they have a shot for the end zone. Ultimately, Ferguson's pass gets picked off in the end zone, but it was a back and forth football game, and it was a game that you really kind of felt like whoever had the football last had a really good chance of winning that football game. And and just some some stats kind of from the game that really stuck out to me. And again, like you said, Chuck, it was one of those things that uh, when you looked at the stat sheet, it really didn't tell the tale of the tape. Um, you know, these games, the last two games have been decided by one possession. And, and that just talks about how good these teams are. And what's interesting is Lenore Ryan uh, had 483 yards of offense. That's the most on the Wingate defense in over two years. So that's a phenomenal job. Just, you know, it was a shootout and, uh, and, and actually, you know, it, it, it really, the D it, and actually there was, it was, I'm trying to find the number right here, guys. It was 922 yards of total offense between both teams oh, on a yeah. game when we thought defense was going to talk about it for their day, but uh, either way, it was a great football game. Lenore Ryan just fell short uh, and, and falls from the ranks of the unbeaten. And, and, and I'll say this, we, we kind of wrote off Wingate at six and three, five and two in the league, and they've clawed their way back into this thing. So, uh, kudos to Coach Reich and Coach Reich and his staff. You know, it's been mentioned a couple times that the stats don't always tell the uh, the story of the game, and I think we've got another one just like that. With uh, a fourteen to twelve win over Augustana, as the Vikings fall from the ranks of the undefeated. Yeah, kind of a wild deal. I saw them a week ago, really have their way with Bankato, and then all of a sudden they find themselves in this, uh, <laughs> and you know. Uh, all of a sudden, they, they're, they're trying to move the ball, and Bauman's getting sacked, and uh, Wayne's kind of getting after him a little bit. Uh, Wayne scored on a, on a deep pass. Then all of a sudden, they get a pick six here, and it's a 14-2 to two game after a series of bad snaps by Wayne, which uh, weren't exactly easy to corral in the snow. Everybody seems like they're having a lot more fun than they're really having. And... Um, <laughs> Then uh, Epperson with the fumble, who had an otherwise very productive day. I mean, Augie had a, a, you know, almost 300 yards of offense, but they turned the ball over three times through the air, one time on the ground there, and they they kind of finished with a pick here on the sideline, and it, uh, it it was kind of a wild deal, Brandon, because Wayne finishes with 20 yards of offense. Okay, now they had, you know, they 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 had positive yardage, but they had almost 80 yards in bad snaps, and, well, that counts. So it's not like that, that doesn't count. And uh, so just kind of a wild deal. They got themselves up 14-2. Augie tried to dig back, but just 
it, it was too hard to execute offensively, especially in the passing game with that kind of weather. Matt, let's stay with you and talk about uh, one more Northern Sun game. Tremendous uh, comeback attempt falls short. Bemidji State with a 38-31 win over Minnesota Duluth on the road. Yeah, and, and balmy good weather up at Duluth, of course. <laughs> um, you know, go, go figure. But uh, Bemidji got after Duluth right away. And uh, Alt was hitting targets all over the field. Uh, they were complementing that with rushing. And this was a 28-10 to 10 ball game by half. And, uh, you know, Kyle Wall Jasper, the – the linebacker-ish quarterback for, for Duluth, uh, was still able to go ahead and and, and lead his group back, and, and they battled and battled and battled and got this all the way to within a touchdown at the end. But, uh, you know, you, you see him here hitting a wide-open target, just kind of a blown cover there. And Bemidji was able to hold off Duluth, but Duluth kind of proves that they're that team that could be dangerous if they somehow got themselves into the dance. But at the end of the day, Bemidji – still proves that they are one of the top teams in the Northern South. Very good. Uh, pretty good weekend uh, with a lot of upsets and surprises. A couple other things to mention. Uh, two monster upsets in the top 25. Bloomsburg beats number 21, Shepherd, And Southwest Baptist beat number 22, Truman State. Uh, one of those will certainly have an effect on the regional rankings. Uh Two unbeatens came back after being down two scores in the second half to win against unranked opponents. Davenport <laughs> over Sa uh, Saginaw Valley and Central Washington over Kingsville. A couple other notes. John Matoka set a new Division II record for total touchdowns in a career, passing the previous mark of 171 set by Tyson Bagent last year. And the PAC championship matchup is resolved one week early. Slippery Rock and Kutztown won the divisions with a game to spare and will meet for the PSAC championship. More to come on Inside D2 Football. October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and D2Football.com and Inside D2 Football are teaming up with the Pink Clover Foundation. This 501c3 nonprofit foundation was formed by family and friends after the passing of Colleen Sorbello in 2017. While she was fighting breast cancer for four years, she participated in many trials and was passionate about finding a way to make the treatment less harsh for women fighting breast cancer. Pink Clover's mission is to raise money for breast cancer research, provide free breast cancer education seminars, and closest to their hearts, provide comfort for women who are struggling while battling breast cancer. Since 2018, Pink Clover has raised over $670,000, providing direct assistance to women affected by breast cancer. They have also partnered with three hospitals and raised money for research, including the University of New Haven's Breast Cancer Research Laboratory. To see how you can help, visit pinkcloverfoundation.org or visit their Facebook or Instagram pages by searching Pink Clover Foundation. Well, I have to imagine that, uh, let me pull that down first, folks. Um, I have to imagine that a lot of people are here um, so that they can hear what we have to say about regional rankings. Uh, it's an exciting time of year and a time when we really dive into them. Uh, let's go ahead and take those rankings in order. Switch back to that. And I'm going to start in Super Region 1 tonight. Um, thanks for Inc. Blot for the use of his data. Um, as you see with the sort by the numbers, it's Slippery Rock, Tiffin, Charleston, East Stroudsburg, Frostburg State, Kutztown, and Cal would be the top seven. Uh, now, that's just by the uh, raw numbers. And we took a deeper dive, and we're going to try to predict what we think they might be tomorrow. So, uh, Chuck, Super Region 1, what are your thoughts on the way they might look tomorrow? I think the top three are are pretty well set and pretty easy. I think you've got obviously you got two nine and zero teams. You start there. Slippery Rock has the advantage over Tiffin in, with, in all the metrics, so you, you're going to have Slippery Rock at one and Tiffin at number two. I think Charleston's a pretty clear number three based on the record, the strength of schedule, the wins against teams over five hundred. I think that they are a very clear number three. Where it gets interesting is when you get down to number four. When you look at the the records. 
that would suggest East Stroudsburg is going to be number four. And I won't be surprised if they land on the four line. It's very possible that the committee is just going to group these teams by the zero loss teams, the one loss teams, and the two loss teams, and then rank them within those groups. It's very possible that they will do that. But I think if you really dive a little bit further, I think you have a good case to move Frostburg State up to the number four position, right behind Charleston, who they lost to yesterday. Uh, Frostburg has three wins against teams that are over 500. They have a vastly superior SOS to East Stroudsburg. And I think if you put them at four, you have to remember that Kutztown has a head-to-head win over East Stroudsburg. So, you know, typically head-to-head only comes into play when two teams are very close to each other and the records are equal. But I think it, when you look at the SOS, um, the wins over 500 and that head-to-head, I think you could put Kutztown ahead of them. But then you also have to put California ahead of Kutztown. Um, so I go Frostburg four, California five, and Kutztown at six. Unfortunately, that bumps East Stroudsburg potentially all the way down to number seven. Uh, now, that's not saying that this is how it's going to go. I, I will kind of be surprised if the committee does do it that way. But if I was ranking them, that's probably how it would come out. Um, keep in mind, guys, we still have a lot of football to be played, even just right. among the group of teams that I'm talking about. This week, you've got East Stroudsburg at Shepherd, huge matchup. Finley at Ashland. That's going to be a, a big factor here because Finley is a team to, to not o- overlook. If there's somebody who could jump into the picture who's not even on this page, potentially could be Finley uh, because well, they have two that, opportunities. Chuck? Well, they've got two uh, quality opponents coming up. So they've got um, uh, they've got Ashland and they've got Tiffin coming up at the end of the year. So if they win both of those games, that really changes the picture here quite a bit, I think. Uh, so mm-hmm. Finley really could be a team that jumps into the picture uh, if they win both of those games. And obviously that would also then give Tiffin a loss. So it really would shuffle the order here quite a bit. Um, and in the last week of the season, you've got several games. We already talked about Slip Rock and Kutztown. Cal and East Stroudsburg play in that last week of the season. Frostburg and Fairmont State play in the last week of the regular season. So there's still a ton to resolve in this super region just with the teams that are that are, uh, that are in play. Go ahead and transition to Super Region 2, where Chris is our expert. Uh, as you see, by sheer data, Benedict is 1, Valdosta is 2, Delta is 3, Lenore Ryan is 4, Mars Hill is 5, West Florida and Virginia Union round out the top seven. What are your thoughts on Super Region 2, Chris? Well, I mean, certainly a huge jump up for Valdosta State after Lenore Ryan. Uh you know, takes a loss. And I think that's the kind of chaos that I, I was certainly concerned about oh, with Super Region 2 going into this week. Um, and, and so the way that Valdosta kind of vaults up like that, I mean, that is a huge jump. Um, you know, certainly what's also interesting is that we talk a lot about um, potential rematches in the first round. If, if things were to end today, you kind of looking at like a Lenore Ryan Fable State Part Two. Who wants to see that? Um, I, I'm not very fond of that. And I, I actually wanted to ask Chuck that, but my internet started acting crazy about Super Region One a little bit because something that's kind of unique is a USC Pembroke that is on the ten line in Super Region One, but they are just flat out right in the Super Region Two footprint. And, and that could certainly present a, a really unique scenario for the committee. Um, you know, also pretty big jumps. Um, Virginia Union uh, now really in the mix. Virginia State right there, right behind them. And, and, and basically you have like this just log jam of CIAA teams uh, right there at, at the very bottom of the uh, of the ranking. So, you know, somebody got to win, right? And you know, barring an upset by Winston-Salem State, which I just, let's not even talk about that or I have to grab my wine glass. Uh, <laughs> uh, you've got a pretty big rivalry coming up and then you've got the, the championship game. So um, just a lot to really look into or, or look forward to this weekend. Probably the one team that's not on this list to, to really think about is Wingate. Uh, they're sort of, sort of on the outside looking in just because they are three losses. But, you know, if if uh, Super Region 2 continues to be as chaotic as it's been, um, then certainly uh, I think that they're probably right on the outside looking in to get into the top 10. Very good. All right, let's go ahead and move to 
Super Region 3, and I'll actually take this one. Um, I think that the teams could be grouped in as many as four groups, but to keep it simple, do three groups. Um, with the help of Matt and Chuck, uh, you take the first two. They're clearly Harding and Pittsburgh State. Now, there's a question that will be answered tomorrow because it is known, and we've known this since we've been doing this show and trying to predict these things, that a GAC team and an MIAA team will finish with 500 strength of schedules. That's not the case this year because of Pittsburgh's game against Sioux Falls yesterday. That's going to give Pittsburgh State um, a slight or maybe not so slight SOS advantage over Harding. Uh, So the question is, tomorrow – it should look at, like Harding over Pitt State, as you see on the screen. Uh, but at the end of the at the end of the season, if both remain undefeated, there would be a flip, and Pitt State would be in the number one spot. Um, and the question is, do they does the committee want to have to deal with answering those questions? So it'll be interesting to see where they land uh, tomorrow. In hey, the hey, ne- I got a question for you. Yes. Like, how big of a deal is it to see Harding in that number one slot? Because I don't think we've seen that in a long time, if ever. Well, they I don't know if I can recall it, but it's not surprising because of the way their schedule's set up. You know, the, the, they've played the, the teams that give them the strength of schedule boost, and as you see, it's 522 over 516. And otherwise, everything else is kind of just the same. It's exactly the same. And, but we're used uh, to seeing a GLIAC team on the top, though. What's that? We're used to oh. seeing a GLIAC team. Oh, unbeaten. I got, I got right. you. We don't have, we don't have Ferris and Grand Valley at the top. We don't have Northwest Missouri State in there. So I got gotcha. you. Yeah. Okay, just, just okay. a different picture. Okay. Hey, fair enough. Good observation, Chris. Um, all right. Uh, speaking of GLIAC team, uh, Grand Valley and Indianapolis are in the next group. Now, if you look on the screen, Indianapolis would be uh, ahead of Grand Valley, but I think uh, we think that the Grand Valley strength of schedule. The 100 points better, and they're also 3-1 and one versus teams over 500. So even though there's one loss, flip Grand Valley and Indianapolis, making Grand Valley 3, Indianapolis 4. Now now we've got 5 through 9. Truman made this a little easier by losing, so um, we have, uh, you know, one fewer, uh, one lost team. But Central Missouri, uh, probably at 6. Their strength of schedule is better uh, marginally, and 3-1 uh, and one versus 500. Davenport is undefeated. Now, um, they're hard. We got them at six. You know, from I was looking at them, it's hard to evaluate uh, the strength of schedule and winning percentage because they really haven't played anybody. It's really hard to evaluate them, but uh, it's better than uh, the rest of the group, Wachita, uh, Ferris, and Southern Arkansas. And then that's the order. Wachita would be seven, Ferris would be eight, Southern Arkansas uh, would be nine. Um, anyway, that that's kind of the way that – it could come out tomorrow. No guarantees, uh, as you know. Brandon, I got you, I got you have Ferris 10? I'm sorry? Did you have Ferris 10? Uh, Ferris at 8. Ferris at 8. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. I'm sorry. Truman 10 then. Okay. Yes. I didn't even go to 10. Uh, oh, okay. Yes. Yeah, I didn't. I just stopped. I stopped there. I, I've i been saying that, you know, a one-loss team is going to get left out. Obviously, that's not going to happen because my inability to predict the the – Southwest Baptist upset of Truman uh, really stone a wrench in those plans. But um, I, I think, you know, the two loss Southern Arkansas has a chance. I, I don't think there's any chance that a 10 loss Truman state or a two loss Truman state with their numbers would, would be in that. So Brandon, I didn't even know. we don't have Ferris in the top seven right now. Do you have any, if you're a Ferris fan watching this, do you think there's any fear of them not getting in the top seven? No. Like, come, so. come the end of the season. No, I don't think so. Well, well, there, there would be lose to Davenport. Right. You know, I mean, they beat Davenport. They're going to have a head-to-head. And and obviously, I obviously think Davenport's going to lose to Grand Valley as well. But let's say that they pull some upset and somehow beat Grand Valley. They have to lose. They have to beat Davenport or they should be out anyway. Right. Um, the numbers and, and all the criteria won't matter. They should be out. Anyway. That's that's the way I see it. I, I, just, I just want to mention that Basically, the GLIAC has the GSC problem. You know, it's hard to schedule games to begin with. Yeah. You get games on there, and you kind of see fair six and one, right? Mm-hmm. And, that, and that makes it a bit challenging when you've got teams that have a little bit more 
um, body of work to show for it. Mm-hmm. So now, so now they're basically in a win or go home scenario. They're already in the playoffs here, and, and they've got to beat Davenport to, to sort of get in, as y'all have mentioned. So I, I just find that really interesting to see, and I think a lot of viewers are seeing that Ferris at nine is just really, really surprising. But it, it makes sense. Yeah, I've complained about the scheduling issue and how it affects the GLIAC teams. How the MIAA would have the insular schedule and not the inability to schedule. GLIAC teams, and they would have nobody to play, and then they would try to use that against GLIAC teams at the end of the year, and I just, that's uh, it, not it, not fair, I mean, quite it, frankly. so It happens with the CIAA quite a bit as well, so it's, uh, it's kind of sobering to see it happen to other conferences yeah. as well, but I just think that's just kind of where we are as a, as a division, quite well, honestly. It, it happens on the edge. I mean, anything on the yeah. outside of the circle is what it is. It's easier to schedule in the middle, which is one of the reasons that the schedules of the Northern Sun, the GAC, and the MIAA have been an issue over the past few years. So, but I save all my rants now for the overtime, so let's go ahead and get to Super Region 4. <laughs> and uh, Matt, take it away on that one, please. Yeah, Super Region 4. Uh, mine's obviously kind of made the path to number one, I think, crystal clear. Uh, you see them right there. They, they're they probably the number one overall seed in the land when you take a look at their factor 9-0 and with a 628 SOS, five wins over 500 better. Good governor. Um, so when the, the question becomes, okay, what's it look like after them? And Central Washington has 72 games. Uh, their strength and schedule isn't good in the company of the teams chasing them. And then from there, they've got two wins against 500 or better. Also, not a great number. So I think Western Colorado ends up on the two line tomorrow because of the fact they have a 100-point higher strength of schedule. They've got another win over 500. Um, If we had to go all the way down to performance indicators, they even have that. So I think unless there's a judgment placed on Western Colorado getting blown out against Mines, which there could be, Uh, I think that we'll still see Western Colorado on the two line. Uh, Then as you kind of move down the page from there, uh, Permian Basin, I think, is a a strong four. And then you get into the five, six, seven thing where we have one loss teams from the Northern Sun kind of vying for who's next. Well, five, six, seven, for what it's worth, doesn't matter all that much anyway, because five, six, seven are all on the road if the playoffs started tomorrow. So, uh, I, right now, five should be Augustana because of the fact they have the head-to-head over uh, Mankato, and Mankato's got a head-to-head over Bemidji, Bemidji. And if you take a look at them left to right, they're pretty similar. So I was thinking Augustana, Mankato, Bemidji. Then we have kind of a distant eighth. Um, and I, I wouldn't doubt that these top seven you see right here, Brandon, are going to be the seven, okay? Because eight, nine, ten – are getting a little ways to go. So if we're taking a look here, Wayne let, State. I let think me let me interrupt. Up. Let me yeah. interrupt for a second, just to be clear. Is is the gap because of the number of losses? Is it that simple? The, yes, and okay. because the teams that are being chased all have good strength of schedule already. Okay. So it's not like the there we're, we're chasing somebody at five, six, seven who have weak numbers. Okay. Okay. Um, Wayne State is who I would have next on the eight line. Because of the fact, not only do they have strong strength, strength of schedule, but they got three wins over quality opponents there. Okay, Angelo's only got one, so I would have Angelo then on the next line, which is nine, and then I actually have Minnesota Duluth on the ten line, who's just below Pueblo there, uh, only because they have one less loss. But uh, that's a crapshoot, and and either Pueblo or Duluth really has a long way to go, even if they're on the page. To be real frank. Very good. All right. Well, that's a look at what we think will happen um, tomorrow or what could happen tomorrow in terms of the regional rankings. We will look at our picks when we come back. Just wanted to take this opportunity to thank those who have supported D2 football this year. D2 football is free, but it isn't cheap. Your support helps offset our expenses and allows us to expand our coverage. If you like what we're doing, please consider supporting us. Visit d2football.com support 
Or if you want to do it the old-fashioned way, click contact on the website to find our mailing address. But again, thank you for supporting D2 Football. Very good. Let's go ahead and look at how we did last week in our pick'em results. Uh, not not a bad week. Lots of green. Um, had some uh, issues. Uh, 50-50 on the West Florida Valdosta game. That's good. Um, overall, not a bad week. Uh, you know what? We were all looking really bad when it came to New Haven uh, until they pulled it out at the end. And then uh, those of us who uh, picked mines were feeling comfortable throughout the entire game. I was one of those dopes who took Western, and otherwise I had a perfect slate. Well, then it's not perfect. I mean, if it wasn't for all the calories I've eaten, I'd be thin. So let's go ahead. I regretted that decision before the first quarter was over. (laughs) All right, let's go ahead and look at the ones to watch uh, this week. We're going to touch on those. Fort Hayes at Central Missouri. Allen is at Benedict. Delta is at West Georgia. Tuskegee at Miles and uh, Pitt State at Missouri Western. Ferg, I want to ask you about the two SIAC games. Uh, what are we going to learn? What, what, are, what are going to be the results of these outcomes? Oh, man. So this is a pretty heavy slate. Um, so, you know, Allen went up against Edward Waters, and I thought that would be a lot closer than it did. And, you know, Allen's quarterback, David Wright, is actually one of the one of the um, really, really, really good signal callers, not just in SIAC, but but the in Division Two, in my opinion. Yeah. And he, he, but he's known for throwing interceptions, and he didn't. Right. And I was just thinking, if, if he could stop throwing interceptions, I think Allen has a really good chance of like really just taking off, and they did against that Water. So, um, you know, Allen and Benedict, for those who don't know, basically they're both in the Columbia, South Carolina area. So this is a rivalry game, and uh, and, and it should be fun. Uh, Allen's offense against Benedict's really strong defense, especially defensive line. Um, you know, Benedict started off slow against uh, uh, Savannah State, but they showed why they were. They blasted the third quarter, and, and right. you know, I mean, it was an easy game after that, but. So, so I, I think Benedict's going to carry this one going into the championship game, conference championship game. But uh, I, I think that it does have the opportunity to be uh, a bit uh, entertaining uh, as we get there. Now, Tuskegee and Miles, uh, you know, Miles fell to Albany. Uh, you know, that was kind of a 50-50 game. Uh, and, and so I wasn't necessarily blown away by it. But, you know, I, I thought Miles would kind of, you know, find a way to win. And uh, it certainly shuts them out of the playoffs, most likely at this point. Um, but uh, you know, pretty pretty huge game for these two these two teams. I, I do think Miles is going to bounce back against Tuskegee in this game. But uh, still, it, 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 there's a very exciting finish, huh? It was surprising that outcome yesterday. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Mm-hmm. right, right, right. Uh, but I think it's going to be a pretty exciting finish in the SIAC for sure. It's very entertaining lead this year. Yeah, that, that Allen Benedict rivalry is is really interesting because you mentioned that they're in Columbia, the downtown Columbia. They're literally across the street from each other, and we I'm have a, we have a couple of rivalries that are like that in D two, and that's one where like you could stand at an intersection and you look to your left and that's Benedict, and you look to your right and that's Allen. Like they're literally right on top of each other. Um, I think when Allen first started up the program, they played their games in Benedict Stadium. For yep, a while. they did. So this is one where they like they literally see each other like all day, every day. So mm-hmm. it's 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 pretty cool. And obviously, Allen's never had this good of a team to bring to the fight. So I think that could be a pretty good one. Um, I think the favorites are going to win in the MIAA. The Fort Hayes uh, will or Central will. Well, Fort Hayes will put up a fight, but Central's going to win that one. Missouri Western have, having a great year. Well, you know what? Fort Hayes is having a great year, too. A bounce back for them after a couple of down years. But I think uh, the favorites are going to win. In the MIAA, Justin, um, what threat does West Georgia pose to Delta State? <laughs> so I'm going to tell you what. This game is really intriguing to me for two reasons. One, West Georgia, and we haven't really talked about it. We didn't talk about them when we were talking about regional rankings, guys. They have two losses, right? Their their last two games are Delta State, Valdosta State. So we haven't mentioned them in the playoffs, but let them win those last two games, and then yeah, see see where it goes from there, right? Right. But on the flip 
But on the flip side of that, the other thing that's intriguing to me is Coach Cooley, Patrick Sheegog and company, they've had two weeks now to fester on a 24-21 loss to West Florida, right? Give them two weeks. Yeah, let let it sit there and and, and fester and stew for two weeks and see what happens. They're on the road this week at West Georgia. This is going to be a classic game. I I think it's just it's going to be exciting to watch. I think Delta State, if they come out firing like we think that they can, I think it's going to be an offensive shootout. You know, West Georgia can score points, but uh, this game is going to be exciting. I, I'm really excited to watch this one. Very good. Let's move on to our pick em this week where we see East Stroudsburg at Shepherd, Limestone at Barton, Ferris State at Davenport, Finley at Ashland, and Virginia State against Virginia Union. Uh, let's start in the order you see them, East Stroudsburg at Shepard, and Ferg, you get to go first. Well, um, you know, East Stroudsburg's coming up. Well, they're what? They're one losses to Cutstown, and, uh, you know, it's going to make things really interesting going against a Shepard team that, you know, is coming off of a very shocking, very disappointing loss to um, the fighting Chuck Bittners. Um, I I don't know if I'm really sold on ESU right now. I just feel I don't know. I just feel like when they go up against teams like this, that they just really let me down. So I'm not sold. I'm going to go with Shepard. I kind of agree with you. I had that same gut feeling about East Stroudsburg that they kind of let you down a little bit. Wit, your turn. Well, I'm going to bring some hate. Um, for if anybody wants to send in their mail to me, feel free to. I haven't had Shepard ranked the entire season. Not That's one week. True. I didn't believe in them. And uh, I felt like I was kind of proven right a week ago. And I think they've had a softer schedule. I think Stroudsburg's defense is good enough to win. Not sure if they're going to have enough on offense. But uh, I'm riding the East Stroudsburg train here. Very good. Uh, Justin, I'm gonna cur- I'm gonna put the curse on Wit, I guess, because I was gonna take East Stroudsburg on the road. All right. Tony. Instantly, I'm questioning my pick. Yeah. <laughs> Just a dare. Too, late. Oh, dare. Too late. Get ready to really want to take a Pepto Bismol because I think <laughs> I'm taking East Stroudsburg too. I, guys, I <laughs> Shepherd. I, you know, having been to that stadium and seen how that community comes out after they're coming off a tough, uh, you know, disappointing performance a week ago, you just think they're going to come out angry. But when I look at the fighting Jimmy two earliers, man, they're more consistent. The defense is better. I, I just, I'm just playing a gut call here and just taking East Stroudsburg. Very good. Chuck. Well, I actually saw both of these teams play Kutztown in back-to-back weeks. And um, I, I kind of came out of that. Or Kutztown won both those games, but I came out of that thinking that East Stroudsburg was a, a really good football team. Uh, Shepherd's good too, but they have some warts. They have some problems. We certainly saw that yesterday. Um, you know, Shepherd's tough to beat at home, but I, I actually just think East Stroudsburg's the better team right now. So I'm going with the Warriors. All right, very good. Limestone at Barton. Uh, limestone six and three. Barton five and two. I'm going to pick Limestone to move to seven and three. Wit. Oh, uh, I, you know, I, I've had somebody on the panel here, Coach Poe, telling me for weeks that Limestone is the best three-loss team in the country, which is an interesting comment, uh, best three-loss team. I didn't um, know he lived in Allendale. I thought he lived on the East Coast. Yeah, <laughs> only, yeah. only insiders will know that one. Sorry, <laughs> so I uh, – I like Limestone. I, I I think they could have been a playoff team and because I, I don't think they're going to make it, but they just tripped up a little bit too much early in the season. I'll take Limestone here. Okay. And uh, Chuck. Yeah, Barton's just been a little up and down uh, this year. They've kind of you know, they've had they've had some good weeks. They've had some bad weeks. I think Limestone. You know, despite having the the three losses, I think they've played at a more consistent level. So I'm I'm going with the Saints. Okay. And Justin, well, you know what? Nope. Let's go, with Tony first. Well, and it, I, maybe I'm missing something. Is isn't Barton five and four? Yeah. Yeah. So, like, um, one of those. Yes. Yeah. yeah one of those so is I not mean, comparable to the rankings, but yes. Tony, what would be these graphics if we didn't have one that was a mystery? 
Oh well, that's I'm not yeah, I'm not I'm not criticizing the graphics again. That's you know oh, that's am. part of our weekly quiz for the viewers so that they could say, oh, that's not right. Gotta like, have which one? Here. Which one did Brandon mess up in a rush to get this crap up? Yeah, they're, they're, yeah, actually, exactly. they're actually yeah. they're actually nine and zero. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, and so to me again, I mean, I take a look at that. I've heard similar things about limestone, and for me, Barton's lost three straight. I mean, you got two teams going in different directions. I like limestone. Uh, Chris. Yeah, I, I, as much as like I like Barton, uh, when you look at who those four losses to, I mean, it's the top half of the sack, and and Limestone is certainly one of those teams that belongs in the top half of that conference. So, uh, I, I'm going to go with the Saints. Okay, and Justin. Yeah, so this is this is going to be, I think. Um, it's going to be interesting because limestone's got to be able to stop that Barton rushing attack. If they can do that, I think their offense is, is a little bit too powerful for the Bulldog defense. And so I think limestone's going to win, assuming that they they're at full strength and they have, uh, you, you know, everybody there on Saturday. I think, I think limestone will, will uh, win. All right. Uh, next fair state of Davenport with, um, watch fair amount of the Davenport game the other day. I think they have some weapons offensively that can hurt Ferris. Um, I just think if Ferris is focused and if they are hungry to make the playoffs, I like Ferris to win this game. Okay, Chuck. Yeah, Ferris is certainly the more talented football team, but it, you know it's going to be interesting to see what their approach is to this because I think that they're going to be a little shocked and pissed off when they see the rankings tomorrow. And does that really inspire them and they want to go out and prove who they are and what they are? Or, you know, are they a little bit dispirited? Um, regardless, you know, Ferris State's the better team. I got to go with them. Justin. Ferris State. Uh, Chris. You know, I, I had the opportunity to see Davenport in, in person, and, and I think they're a great team, but – I, I just don't know if I'm ready to elevate them above Ferris in a game like this. I just don't see it. I'm going to go with the Bulldogs. Well, I think I think Davenport got lucky yesterday, and or fortunate, however you want to look at it. And I have been since about week two. I've been telling everybody how they're going to lose the last two. So how could I uh, pick anybody but Ferris? But Tony, you get the last word. Yeah, well, and guys, I mean, we saw this a similar scenario last year, right, where Davenport was undefeated going into the last two weeks of the season um, and, you know, struggled against Ferris and then really had a tough go against Grand Valley in week 11. So uh, you know, this is a similar uh, story path that we're on here. Again, I, and I don't think any – this is nothing revelatory. I think everybody said it. I think at this point when you look at – I mean, Fer uh, Davenport's strength of schedule thus far, again, they've been playing teams that – I don't think they have any wins or anybody who's got a 500 or better record, and that kind of speaks volumes, especially when you look at how close they've made some of these games. I'll give them credit for finding ways to win. Uh, I think, Brandon, you're you're dead on that they've got some weapons. Um, I was a little surprised to see how uh, little or in a, little they used or ineffective Myron Harris was against Saginaw Valley yesterday. I don't think you'll see that again. I think they'll try and get him the ball and, and, and see what they can do with him. Um, I think, to me, the biggest key is – you know, uh, Davenport's a 16, 17 point a game allowed defense, which is, you know, really good defense nationally. Which is, can they, surprising. I mean, can they get, surprising. yeah, can they get stops uh, against Ferris and can they get pressure on those quarterbacks and make them uncomfortable? That's the key to keeping this close. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, I, again, I got to go back to the Missouri, the Missouri uh, axiom. And until I see it, it's tough, it's tough to pick against Ferris State. So I'll take Ferris. Uh, moving on to Finley at Ashland. Chuck, go first, please. Uh, Finley, they mm -hmm. have the best defense in the GMAC. Um, was very impressed with what I saw from them yesterday. You know, their offense isn't explosive, but they can be sneaky good. Um, really good offensive line in that unit. You know, they've got size, they've got strength. Um, they tend to make plays when they really need to have them. Um, Ashland has won five in a row, so this is definitely a tough game, but um, I'm going Finley. Okay, Justin. Hmm. Finley. Other than I like the, are they the Oilers? Yeah, they are. They are the Oilers. Well, that's why. Tony. 
Well, I, I really struggled with this one, guys. Um, again, you know, I mean, Ashlyn, you got to think on its face, probably came into the season with a little more talent. and But, uh, you know, change of the coaching staff, had to get everything figured out. They did lose a couple of all-timers, um, you know, on both sides of the ball. Uh, but they've righted the ship. I, I like their momentum. Man, I'm still struggling with what to do with this one. Uh I'm gonna I'm gonna take Ashland. I don't know why. Um, everybody's points about Findlay are are strong, and and it wouldn't surprise me either way. But again, I'll just, I'll play the gut call and go with Ashland. Hmm. Sure. <sighs> well, you know, neither one of these teams really blow me away, and I, I think I'm more excited about this game because it's Ashland, and I'm always interesting to see what Wit has to say. <laughs> So <laughs> there's that piece of it. Um, but I think in the end, I, I think Finley um, may have a little bit of the edge. Give me the Oilers as well. All right. I will pick Finley as well. And Wit, you get the last one. Final well, call. despite the fact that uh, Ashland threw shade my way last year in the playoffs <laughs> before they departed, um, I, uh, I am did, going by the way, to – Did they tell you congratulations on – getting this last prediction correct or did they just fade off? No, the they, for, for those who weren't around for it, um, I think they, they kind of clapped at me a little bit and um, that was okay. Cause um, you know, uh, the end was near nonetheless. <laughs> and um, so as I take a look at this here, I, I want to take Ashland. I really do for the same reasons Tony was mentioning, but you know what? I think Finley's just been a better team this year. I'm taking the Oilers here. All right. And one last game, Virginia State at Virginia Union. And uh, I'll start with Justin. Virginia State, and I don't know that it's going to be close. Okay. Uh, Tony. It's the D2 game of the week here, guys. I mean, a couple of 8-1 teams, man. Awesome. Uh yeah, I mean, you look at just week in, week out, what the expectations are of these teams. I get what Justin's saying, Virginia State. I just, I don't know, man. Sometimes, sometimes you just got to do what you got to do against the teams you're supposed to beat. Virginia Union had Virginia Union has not scored fewer than forty two points in five weeks, and they've dropped three straight fifty burgers. And I get it may not be against the stiffest of competition, but I don't know, something about that offense. I don't know. I'm 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 taking Virginia Union here. I, maybe I'll be proven silly, but that's my gut. I'm going with that. Berg, I got a question before I make my pick. Is that All right, no way? No, no, you can't do that. <laughs> oh, yeah. There's no, there's no on the fly research. What is this? Yes, there is. Yes, yes. Is the is the winning streak? Does it coincide with Jada Byers' return? I'm just curious. Yes. Okay. Well, well, well. Except for the first yes, one, right? Yes, the first yes, one yes. The win streak is is with his return. Yes. Okay. I'm picking Virginia Union. Uh, Wit. Uh, I like what Virginia Union's. I make the rules. Been doing. And, uh, <laughs> I'm doing. I'm going to take them. I'm taking Virginia Union, despite okay. your, your cheating there, Brennan. <laughs> Chuck. Uh, I like Virginia Union. Uh, I think that they're you know, <laughs> one play away from, from being an undefeated team, you know, on a sloppy night, you know, they just had a really tough day in bad weather against Fayetteville state, you know, last year they lost the one game that kept them out of the CIAA championship game. And and they were the best team in the CIAA last year. I'm convinced of that lost the one game that kind of kept them out of that. I don't think they're going to let that happen this year. Rivalry game at home for them. I'm going Virginia union. All right. And Chris, you get the final word. Well, let me just, make this about not either of these two teams for a brief second you know the fact that Fable state has already wrapped up the ciwa south for like what the seventh straight year or some some ridiculous number <laughs> plays into this game a little bit because the fact that now we've got two teams that are looking to face them in the ciwa championship game two weeks from now and honestly i wish they would just end in a tie but unfortunately, the rules don't allow that. <laughs> um, so here you've got Virginia State, who's two weeks away from in the past from losing to a one win team at the time and going through a lot of, uh, of injuries, but a very resilient bunch. And then you've got Virginia Union, who's had their own injuries and try to figure things out 
at, at quarterback, but they continue to play the two quarterback system. And they've got, you know, Jada Byers, one of the best running backs in Division Two, and and depth behind them. Overall, to me, um, it's a very exciting game because I think that there's going to be quite a bit of offense in this game because Virginia Union is definitely can be exposed in the passing game, and that's the strength of Virginia State. But in the end, uh, I, I really think that Virginia Union is probably looking forward to a rematch against Fable State in much better weather conditions than the 7-0 and game that we saw in which, you know, remember like Wayne, Wayne State and, and Augie, and, and Wayne wins with 20, 20 yards of offense? They're going to they're play in the snow park? I, I hope not, because if I, I'm not going to the game if that happens. <laughs> but but remember, you know, Fayetteville State won that game with less than 100 yards of offense. And I think Virginia Union is looking forward to a rematch in much better condition. So they, they just got a lot to play for here. And I, I just think that Virginia Union is, is going to come out with just enough to take this game. All right. Very good. All right. We'll see how uh, how the – Games, uh, how they come out next week. So. Well, you're all uh, wrong. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> all right. And for um, the record, come out. One thing, if it does yeah. snow on Saturday, I know, Chris, if you're going, you're not going. If it snows on Saturday, I'm done. Like, I live in this region, and it's 70 degrees today. If it snows on Saturday, uh, you're, you're not going to see me for a while. Well, d- dude, it's like it's like 80. It was like 81 today where I live, and it's going to be yeah. like 29 in a couple of days. I know. Quit whining, Jim record, Cantori. Right. If it wow, snows, I'm out. And you're, what are you going to move back? The weather patterns over here are moving this way. <laughs> uh, <right>. <laughs> <laughs> We're pushing the cold air down. Right. Yeah. We'll share it with the rest of you. <laughs> hey, don't forget to tell your friends about us. We'd appreciate that. You are our marketing team. Uh, follow us on social media. Uh, most of them, if you just search for D2 Football, you will find us. And, of course, in the description on YouTube, you'll find all, all of our uh, Twitter accounts. You'll find out how to reach us there. Uh, columnists and podcasters in this group do a great job, including Antonio Clark, who joined us at the beginning of the show. Uh, they're doing a fantastic job this year. Please check out their work. Uh, and uh, again, we provide a scoreboard that you can sort by top 25 by conference and by super region, which is important uh, this time of year. Uh, also invite you to join the message board where we have the biggest collection the best D2 fans in the country. want to thank KBJR-TV. want to thank uh, Dakota News Now, the RMAC Network. Uh, also want to thank WCTV and as well as Inkblot Sports for the use of his data. Uh, that'll do it for our regular segment tonight. Stay tuned. When we come back, uh, we'll have the overtime segments where we will answer your criticism, questions, or take any compliments you would like to provide, but uh, that'll do it uh, for the main segment. We'll see you in just a minute.